So Uber pre-existed Lyft, but they were using car service drivers, right? Yeah, exactly. So who, who first had the idea of using just folks as drivers? So Lyft launched with peer-to-peer -peer drivers first huh. uh, in, in mid-2012. Uh, Uber was very hesitant to get into that market, uh, but ultimately saw that uh, that was the direction that the whole space was going in. I am David Pogue, and this is another Yahoo Tech, Yahoo Tech Mix, these one-on-one -on -one interviews with cool people from the tech world, and I'm here today with the co-founder of Lyft, Logan Green, thanks for joining me, man. Thanks for having me. You were briefly here uh, at South by Southwest um, for meetings and stuff. Um, this is fascinating because Lyft, and I guess people always say Lyft and Uber, Lyft and Uber, uh, as the kings of this space, is maybe the most disruptive, life-changing, routine-changing, environment-changing, economic-changing thing to come along in a, in a long time. Yeah. Um, and yet it wasn't really an overnight success. No, we've been at this for over eight years. Yeah. And originally, had a, originally we started the company, it was called Zimride. Uh, but going back even a, a step further, um, I got excited about the space about transportation uh, growing up in LA. Oh. And <laughs> if, you know, if you've spent much time in LA, you know how terrible the traffic there is. And I was traumatized by hours of sitting in traffic, uh, going nowhere having this experience, looking at all of the cars around me, seeing four empty seats in every car, one driver, four empty seats. And just thinking, there's got to be a better way to fix this. How can, we, how can we change transportation? And that kicked off what's now kind of a lifelong obsession with coming up with better ways to, you know, to get people around cities. And what was Zimride, and why haven't we heard of it? Yeah, so Zimride um, was uh, launched out of this desire to create a better public transportation service. So I was on the board of a public transit uh, district in Santa Barbara, where I'd gone to school. I spent about three years on this board, thinking I could get on and sort of through politics, improve public transportation. So a crazy stat, in the US, only 5% of the population gets to work every day on public transit. Everybody else is in a car, and wow. mostly alone in a car. It's kind of kind of depressing. So I got on this board thinking, all right, I'm going to shake things up. I'm going to figure out how to fix it. And you know, maybe we can get to 6%, 7%. Maybe we can do something. Anyway, after three years, I accomplished nothing. Uh, you know, and, and I realized it wasn't just our district. This was every public transit district across the country was you know, struggling. It wasn't because you were incompetent, per se. I, I hope not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I took this trip to Zimbabwe while I was on the board. And I was just traveling with a friend. We were going through southern Africa, and we went, went into Zimbabwe. Uh, and the economy in Zimbabwe was devastated. Nobody could afford to drive their own car. So there was, there was no traffic. It was kind of the opposite of, of LA. Uh, but the government wasn't providing any type of service. So out of you know, sheer necessity, uh, people got around on what they called these combis. An entrepreneur would form a transit route. Uh, they'd charge market rates. And it worked. That's how, you know, almost everybody traveled. So these are ad hoc carpools. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I came back excited to take that type of concept, bring it to the States, and find a way to build a massive crowdsourced public transit service where anybody could get paid to be a driver. Now the problem was we launched in 2007 about six months before the, the iPhone came out. Oh. And so the experience of requesting a ride involved sitting down at your desktop, going on to post a ride, you know, took about five to 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and then you'd have to wait. Someone might message you. It'd take a couple of days to arrange the ride. So anyway, you get the picture. It, it did not work out well for that last minute trip across town. Right. Uh, it was mostly used by college kids getting rides home on the weekend. Oh, I and, see. And we had you know, moderate success with that. We ended up selling it to Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Um, and, and after, so we had been working on Zimride for about five and a half years uh, and kind of frustrated with not having the level of impact we wanted to have on the world we started thinking about how can, we, how can we reformat this? How can we take the same idea but make it work uh, so it's something that everybody can use twice a day? Wow. And, and so out of that, we launched Lyft in 2012. And so explain to the six people who have never used a ride-sharing service um, how this insane system works. 
Sure. So the idea is that uh, anybody with uh, you know a four door car uh, who has a you know a safe background, we run criminal background checks, DMV background checks, do vehicle inspections. Uh, but anybody can use their own personal vehicle after going through our onboarding process uh, to get paid to give rides to other people in their city. And as a passenger, you open up your app. It's dead simple. Uh, you put a credit card on file, hit a single button, uh, and a driver comes and picks you up and takes you wherever you want to go. And I will uh, pause for this moment to tell you about my first Lyft experience. I was in San Francisco where I happen to know the cab fare from the apartment to the airport is about 50, 55 bucks. And I'd never used Lyft before. My wife was encouraging me to do it. I saw a map showing the little icons of Lyft drivers that were cruising near me. I hit pick me up. Um, she pulled up. She was a soccer mom. Her name was Heather. She was in a Honda CRV. Um, I ha this was blowing my mind because all I've ever taken is taxis. I didn't know I was supposed to get in the front seat or the back seat. Uh -huh. You know, I, I got in. She uh, she offered me a water. Uh, she saw that I had an iPhone. Asked if I wanted to charge it. Oh, when nice. is a taxi driver ever? You know, <laughs> like I, it, it blew my mind. And she was funny and interesting. And you know, she didn't yammer on the phone or talk in another language or smell or hate her life. I mean, it was like a great experience. And, um, and, and it was like $32. So I will yeah. never take a taxi in a, in a Lyft city again. Um, it is, it strikes me as just like gigantically disruptive. Yeah. It's one of these rare moments in business when you can provide a higher quality service, a better service at a lower cost, it just explodes. And that's what we saw when we launched Lyft was it just exploded. It was simply a better experience. You know, the taxi system, you know, through sort of poor city regulation have become uncompetitive. And so, you know, taxis aren't working hard for your business the way that, you know, a service like Lyft is. So how did, uh, how did the actual idea come? Like if you told me you were going to set up a nationwide system of ordinary folks. Yeah to pick up other folks, strangers, yeah. riding in it. This is America, man. We fear each other. <laughs> I, I, would have, I would not have funded you. I, I would have said that's, that's never going to work. Yeah. It, so, so we were operating Zimride at the time, and it took a little bit of convincing the board to say, hey, we're going to go in this different direction, try, you know, experiment with this idea of Lyft. Uh, but, but, you know, the idea goes back to that, you know, same sort of Zimbabwe experience. Um, you know, of creating this massive crowdsourced transportation network. How can we get anybody with a few extra hours, you know, out there able to make, you know, a few dollars giving a ride to someone else, you know, whether that's someone else, uh, you know, in their city, if they're taking, you know, folks out to, to, you know, dinner or they're going out to the bars late at night, if they're head, headed to the airport or just on the way into work in the morning, how can we create this network where anybody can be a driver? Okay, so, so, Blow my mind with some facts and figures. How many cities? How many rides? Uh, so Lyft now operates in 65 cities. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of drivers uh, and do millions of rides every month. Wow. Yeah. Um, is, is it a profitable company? So we're profitable in our most mature cities now. Oh, okay. So cities like San Francisco, LA, Chicago are now profitable. Okay. Um, and, and sooner or later, we're going to have to bring up this Uber thing. So first of all, so Uber pre-existed Lyft, but they were using car service drivers, right? Yeah, exactly. So who, who first had the idea of using just folks as drivers? So Lyft launched with peer-to-peer -peer drivers first huh. uh, in, in mid-2012. Uh, Uber was very hesitant to get into that market, uh, but ultimately saw that uh, that was the direction that the whole space was going in. And so they ultimately followed us in. And are, are Uber and Lyft essentially the same thing? You know, there are certain services we have that are competitive, but I think we have very different worldviews. We have very different values. Uh, and I think ultimately you'll see the two companies go in different directions. Um, can, you, can you elaborate sure. on the different values? I mean, look, I'll, I'll, I'll be the bad cop here. I'll, I'll tell you that we've seen a lot of headlines about Uber doing some unsavory things. There were reports that they were trying to poach Lyft drivers. They would try to screw you up by booking a ride and then canceling. They could track a reporter's whereabouts. I mean, there's, there have been one PR disaster after another. And yeah. I actually know people who have switched to Lyft be yeah. because of this. You've been the recipient of some good, good news there. Right. Um, so, so what are, is that just 
bad PR on their part and lucky PR on yours, or, or is there something more philosophically to it? Well, I think, you know, when it comes down to the philosophy of the company, you know, the, the core idea of Lyft is to be inclusive, right? If we're ultimately to have the impact on the world that we want, we need to create a world where, you know, every car on the road feels comfortable joining the network as, as a Lyft driver, and we create a fantastic experience, you know, bringing drivers and passengers together. So that's our core is we need to be inclusive and we need to bring people together. And that drives everything we do. So from how, you know, the policies we have, how we treat our drivers, how we communicate with drivers, you know, the policies we have in place for trust and safety, what we do for passengers, uh, all come around this idea uh, of, you know, being inclusive and being thoughtful. Um, can you, can you give, me any, give me any examples of some of these differences? Sure, yeah. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we bring a new driver into the Lyft community. So uh, in every city across the country, we have what are called Lyft mentors. And a Lyft mentor is a top driver. So after they've given enough, they've given probably several hundred rides, if they're in the top 20% of all of our drivers, they become eligible to become a mentor. Then when a new applicant applies, uh, they go through, of course, all of the automated background checks. We're talking, you know, down to the county you know, level, criminal background checks, DMV background checks. But then we match them up with a mentor. And we've tried to make it as, you know, frictionless as it is to, to be a passenger. Uh, this, this experience of, you know, hitting a single button, you get matched with a mentor. Mm -hmm. Mentor comes out, completes a vehicle inspection, and is your first passenger. Mm -hmm. So they're there coaching you onboarding you into the Lyft community, telling you what it's about, giving you tips about you know, how to be a great driver. And that's how we've been able to replicate this sort of community feel at scale. Because every person goes through this kind of one-on-one -on -one experience. It's so like idealistic and <laughs> optimistic. And, and you're saying this all works? Yeah, this is, this is how we've been able to scale so quickly. So if we had to you know, do it the old fashioned way and open up a local office, in each market, hire a big local team. That takes time, right? It's crazy, you know, to think about it. But Lyft is only two and a half years old, mm. you know, and we've, you know, launched sixty-five cities and are onboarding, you know, thousands of drivers every week. Um, so how is it if Lyft had the idea of the peer-to-peer -peer ride providing first? How is it that Uber is now so much bigger and more money and more cities and all that stuff? Um, you know, U Uber's uh, black car business has been around, you know, was, was around for several years before Lyft, and they already had operations in a number of cities. Uh, and I think that was, you know, helpful for them, you know, gaining scale quickly. I see. Um, and now, speaking of the community feeling, there are some s small differences in what a passenger experiences, right? Yeah. When, so what, talk, tell me about some of these, the conventions yeah, so there are a few conventions that we started with uh, where we, we suggested people sit in the front seat and there would be a, a fist bump between the driver and the passenger. Uh, and we, we created those conventions because we wanted to set a tone within the car of a sort of peer-to-peer -peer community uh, and create an environment where people were just friendly to each other. Because you, you think about the typical taxi experience and you know you get in the back you maybe bark some directions at the driver and that's it it's mm -hmm. not a very you know friendly experience now as lyft has you know matured um, you know there's a big market of folks out there who don't want to fist bump or don't want to sit in the front seat so we tried to make it clear look you know we're trying to create an experience in the car where people are friendly to each other that's it but be comfortable be yourself take lyft however you want to lift so the, the fist bump in the front seat is falling away a little bit? Yeah, you know, there, there are a handful, you know, of, you know, the original lifters that still love it. Uh, and, mo you know, most drivers still know about it. But it's not something, you know, I think we, we've set a really solid foundation with the Lyft culture and the Lyft brand. Uh, and that's something that will continue uh, to develop that, you know, Lyft is about being comfortable being yourself. Lyft is about being human. Um, but it's not just about a sort of convention of a fist bump or the front seat. Right, right. And what about the, uh, the furry uh, pink mustache on the front of the car? Is that still around? So the furry mustache is no longer around. Okay. Uh, last summer, we brought on an amazing person, this guy, Jesse McMillan, who had been the creative director for Virgin America. Huh. And he came on board. Uh, and a couple months ago, we launched the new Glowstash. 
So the, the problem with the mustache was it was a hassle for drivers to take on and off of their grill, mm. and it really didn't hold up in the weather well. Oh. So it worked, it worked better on the West Coast than the East Coast. <laughs> uh, now the glow stash is a little more sleek. Uh, it sits, it's the smallest sits on the dashboard and lights up at night so people can see it. Oh, I see. So okay, that's, that's cool. the, next, the next evolution. Sometimes I'll tell people about Lyft, and I mean, you must encounter this. They're like, I'm not getting in some stranger's car. I mean, that inherent American suspicion yeah. is still there, uh -huh. no matter how idealistic and, and community-based you are. Yeah. Um, what is the record of bad experiences with Uber and Lyft as compared to, say, taxis? Is it any different? Lyft, Lyft is incredibly safe. And in, you know, in most cities, is doing more to screen the backgrounds, uh, more to vet the drivers that get on the road. Uh, and does more to maintain safety. So one thing that taxis can't do uh, is you don't get to rate your taxi at the end That's of the ride. Great. With Lyft, you get to rate, rate your experience, uh, and if a driver falls below a certain threshold, they get offboarded from the system. And if you have a really bad experience and write a note about it, we have a trust and safety team reviewing that. So we you know, go above and beyond sort of what the, the old school systems were able to do for safety. And do the drivers not also rate the passengers? The, the drivers also rate the passengers, they do. So, so it's, it's a, it's a two-way street. If I was a real jerk to every driver, after yeah. a while, would they stop picking me up? Yeah, you might have trouble getting a ride after, <laughs> really? if, if, if you're bad enough, yeah. <laughs> That's <is> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, the master plan, though, as I understand it, is not necessarily peer-to-peer, one-on-one driving, right? Right. So, you know, when we started, our, our goal was never just to create a better taxi. Our goal was to completely change transportation, uh, solve traffic, and make it possible to get anywhere you need to go without having to own a car. And we're starting to make some, some strides in that direction. We, I think we have a good foundation to build off of. But there's, you know, a really, really long way to go. So <clears throat> when we think about the opportunity, the taxi and limo market in the US is about $11 billion. But every year, people spend over $2 trillion on their personal vehicles. Oh. It's about 20% of a household's budget. It's the second highest line item. Driving is crazy expensive. Wow. So we want to change that. We want to make it more affordable to get around. We want to make it possible to get fast, convenient trips wherever you need to go. Uh, and and about six months ago, we launched a new service called Lyft Line. So, you know, from innovating in peer-to-peer -peer in the beginning to now innovating with Lyft Line, we're continuing uh, to push the limits for what you can do with, you know, bringing people and technology together to create a better transportation service. And so, what is Lyft Line? So, Lyft Line uh, matches up two people taking the same trip. So, say we were both heading back to the airport right now. Uh, we both request a ride from here on Lyft Line. We'd get one driver, come and pick both of us up uh, and take us to the airport for a half price. Uh, or say we were doing this you know, every day on our way into work. Uh, and we'll actually match up you know, two to three parties uh, in a car at the same time. All right, so my gut is once again telling me that is such a cool idea. It will never work. Yeah. That is so complex. Yeah. And the software solution must be Staggeringly complicated. Yeah, it is, it is uh, the hardest technical problem that we've taken on. Uh, we acquired two different companies in the process of building this out. Oh, wow. Acquired Rover, a real-time transit routing service, and Hitch that was doing a, a similar shared ride solution. Uh, and uh, have a yeah, phenomenal data science team behind figuring out you know, who are the most e efficient matches. You have to you know, consider traffic patterns because just taking someone a block or two in the wrong direction during morning traffic, you know, can kill your match. Right. So our, our goal is to never take someone more than a few minutes out of their way. Um, and, and LiftLine exists yet? Yeah, so we launched LiftLine six months ago in San Francisco, and uh, it's taken off like crazy. It makes up over a third of the rides we do in San Francisco. What? We just launched it in Austin for South By, uh, and we also have it running uh, more recently in LA and New York. So if I open the app, I'll see an option. If you open up the app, you'll see a new mode, lift line. And a couple things are, are a little different about it. One, you have to enter your destination. And so you're, you're planning your trip ahead of time. Uh, two, we, we fix your price. 
So we give you a price up front and say this ride will be five bucks, say. And that price is based on the likelihood of finding a match along that route. Oh. So as the flywheel starts going and more and more people are taking lift line along a particular route, the prices come further and further down. Um, and how, how far down could this eventually go relative to owning and gassing and insuring a car? So in cities, so in San Francisco, taking lift line for every single trip uh, is cheaper than the annual cost of owning a car. So you can completely switch over already today. E even if I and have to take it to work every day? Even if you're taking it twice a day to work, uh, you know, once a day out for dinner after work, it is cheaper because in a city, if you think about what a hassle it is and how expensive it is to park your car, uh, to maintain your car, insure your car, fuel your car, there are all of these crazy expenses. And in a city, they're much more than, you know, in the suburbs. So today, Lyft Line is cheaper than owning a car in the city. Oh my God, that is right. like seriously disrupted. Yeah. And speaking of which, there are people who don't like all this disruption, right? Certain taxi commissions. Yeah. Um, aren't there people trying to block you? Yeah, there, you know, when, when Lyft launched two and a half years ago, there weren't explicit regulations for how to handle this new type of service. And so what we had to do, we started in California and we, we passed a new set of regulations. And those regulations were then adopted uh, and have been passed in 30 different jurisdictions over the last two years. And we'll, we'll probably go through another 30 jurisdictions in this next year. Th that means states or cities or what? Yeah, so it depends. In California, it's regulated at a state level. Mm. Uh, in other places, like in New York, it's regulated at a city level. I see. And, and these regulations are saying you're okay? Yeah, so these regulations are saying it's okay as long as uh, the cars are insured up to a million dollars, as long as you know, criminal background checks are conducted, as long as they have a valid driver's license, uh, and we follow all of these policies. It, it seems that sometimes um, Lyft or Uber will be available in the city, but not at its airport. What yeah. is that about? So airports are the thorniest, most difficult uh, you know, jurisdiction to work with. They're intensely regulated, uh, and they, um, they have a very, a very tough problem to manage. They have immense traffic flow coming in and out of airports, and there are a lot of additional issues, you know, figuring out where do the cars wait? Uh, you know, is there an extra sort of level of permitting to uh, pay for the airport fees? Mm. And so, um, you know, we're passing uh, new, new regulations and, and signing deals with airports across the country. Um, Nashville was the first one uh, to come through earlier this year. Now we have a deal in place with San Francisco Airport. We just signed one before South by hmm. for Austin Airport. So they're all uh, coming around, but that's that's been a really tricky problem for us. And, and how do you solve? How do the airports solve that problem? What is the deal you're making? Do you have to sit in the cell phone lot or? So the deal with San Francisco Airport, which I think is sort of the deal that will be taken across the country, is we, we actually integrated with an API. So every time when a Lyft driver crosses onto airport property, uh, we let them know, and we, they, they bill us $4. And so we just oh. pass that $4 fee onto the passenger. Oh, funny how money can make regulatory problems evaporate. <laughs> that, that was a big part of it, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's fair because, you know, taxis and limos are paying the same fees. So. Uh -huh. Right. So, yeah. um, so, so what, are, what, what are the financials look like if I'm a passenger and what do the financials look like if I'm a driver, especially compared to taxis? So a, as a passenger, you're probably paying, you know, anywhere between 25 and 50 percent less to take a, a lift. And I'm talking, this is a regular lift, you know, on your own. If you're taking a lift line, it might be, you know, a third of the cost of a taxi. And as a driver, you're making uh, the same, if not more. So the, the problem with the taxi market is you have this middleman who owns the medallion and they take about 50% of everything. So it's a much better deal for a driver uh, to have this direct relationship with a passenger. And as a driver, you also set your own hours, right? You have complete flexibility. So you can work, you know, during the afternoons if that's when you're available, or you can work, you know, as late at night as you want. Can I drive an hour a week? Yeah, you can drive one hour a week. I think our average driver drives about 14 or 15 hours a week. Wow, that's crazy. Um, all right, so 
what so the in the big picture, Lift Line is getting going now. Yeah. Um, but you seem like such a, a utopist. Uh, <laughs> you must have an even an even further vision. Is it is it possible to lift eyes? Other things, airplanes, <laughs> laundry, takeout. I don't know. Yeah. What, what's the so, big vision? So there's there's a lot a lot more to be done. Uh, but we're we're most passionate about moving people, and think we've just scratched the surface sur surface of what we can do here. Uh, so we're testing uh, a new feature called driver destination, where as a driver, when you flip into driver mode, you can enter a destination and only get matched with somebody else taking a trip along huh. that route. And so we figure if you know we can get drivers who are you know taking these trips into work every day, we can lower the price even further and increase the number of drivers on the road. So as a passenger, uh, you know the cost of lift should continue going down and the convenience should continue going up. Oh man. Okay. So I think I found a flaw. Yeah. What by by driving prices down, 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 combining rides more and more and more, aren't you? hurting your own business? Isn't it in your interest to have more and more, more individual rides? We, we will, we do have, we, we will have more and more individual rides. As the price comes down, people take more trips. And that, that's the beauty of it, is you know, we're not interested in going after just a small section of the high-end market. We're interested in, in being you know, a service that people can use every day, twice a day, wherever they're going. Um, I've heard it often said that the, the attraction for ordinary people for Uber and Lyft is that it gives you a sense of having a personal chauffeur at your call, right? So yeah. come get me, Jeeves, yeah. right? But it seems like your approach is going to uh, dilute that a little bit because you're sharing it with other people. Yeah, yeah, we're, that's not the experience that, that we're about creating. We, we want it to be that convenient that you hit a button and somebody is there fast. Uh, and we want to have a delightful experience for you in the car with water and you know a cell phone charger. We want to make it incredible, um, but this isn't you know about creating a, a high roller sort of lifestyle. This is about creating the best way to get from point A to point B. I, I would just never think that uh, an example you saw in Zimbabwe yeah. would fly in you know entitled consumerist America. Yeah. Well, we adapted a little bit, but <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you it's know. Not rickety beat up minivans anymore? <laughs> no, no, none of that. Um, so, but, but you, you maintain that, um, that lift line where you where there's more than just you in the car, um, is successful in San Francisco, obviously, but you think that would fly in less enlightened liberal cities than in San Francisco? Absolutely. At the end of the day, people care most about cost. And if we're able to provide a ride at half the price and it's you know, nearly as convenient, uh, people flock to it. Now, when you, you sort of you know, look at the people and uh, within that group, a huge portion of them actually enjoy the social experience. So you're meeting someone who's interesting. Uh, you know, maybe it's a business networking conversation you have on your way into work, you know, or maybe you, you know, meet someone you have something in common with and just have a great conversation in the car. Uh, so there's there's a huge sort of you know portion of the population that really seeks out that social experience, and then there are others who you know don't, but they're there for the cost and the convenience, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's why it's working and that's why it's going to be huge. I'll buy that. Um, and and just one last thing. So when you guys at the office get word about another um, Uber you know debacle um, where they look mean or they look you know aggressive. Um, what what are the emotions that you feel in house? I mean, what is do you, do you, do you do? Oh my God, you're giving us all a bad name, or do you go? Oh yay, here comes another spike of defectors. No, I think in in general, uh, you know the in general the the way that the industry is viewed is very important. So we don't like to see them trip up the way they have. Um, and anytime something happens, uh, we always take a look internally at ourselves and make sure that we're set up structurally. So that something like that never happens to us. I see. Well, it is kind of interesting. You are a really nice guy and a really idealistic guy, and it does seem like that that's filtering through the whole service. I mean, it's almost like you can you can feel that even in the car you're getting into. Yeah, it's something we worked you know really hard to create a culture not just internally within the company, but across the whole Lyft community. Download the 
Yahoo app to your phone or tablet. 